Okay, Chris. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. I want to start out by telling you what this is not. This is not a class on the steps or a workshop on the steps or um, once you've been here, you don't need to talk to your sponsor anymore <laughs> or anything like that. I've been around a long time and I know a lot of stories and I'm going to tell them all during this 12-week period. And um, in there, you'll hear about the steps and about AA and all of our comings and goings. And I hope through this that your perspective on AA will change if you're new and that you will hear things to make you very excited about being a member of AA and to realize how wonderful it really is. Um, it's very important that I say that because if I make some comment about uh, one of the steps or a principle of the program and your sponsor has told you something else, pay attention to your sponsor. That's the person who is taking you through the steps and um, that's who you want to follow. You want to follow that guidance. And I say that because we all have, who've been around a while see it a little bit differently than the next person. And so there's no official version of anything anywhere. What we have is the official literature and that we stick with. The big book and the 12 and 12. I myself am a great believer in both books. I know the 12 and 12 came in 1950 and the people who were around before that felt like we don't need any new guys on the block but it was written by the same author with um, 12 or 15 years more sobriety and uh, his perspectives especially on about half of the steps in the 12 at 12 are just brilliant absolutely brilliant uh, I mean you look at 6 and 7 I mean coming out of the big book we barely have a handle on them and then in the 12 and 12 here's this wonderful explanation and um, portrait of them. So I'm a believer in using both the books. Next weekend in Akron, Ohio, AA will be 72 years old. It's AA's birthday and there will be 10,000 people in that little city completely overpowering its traffic and um, as they run around jumping up and down celebrating not drinking. <laughs> now they've been doing it there for a long time so the residents are used to it and um, matter of fact I was there last year they plan their yard sales for when AA shows up. <laughs> If you can imagine that, you just you look around, you go, look at all the yard sales that are going on, and then you find out, yeah, this is the most potential buyers that are ever wandering the streets, and they probably get a much better price. So AA will be 72 years old, and when I was born, there was no AA. Now think about that, just in my lifetime, we've gone from nothing in the world that could help alcoholics to an organization and I learned this a couple weeks ago in Delaware the uh, general service manager from the New York office was there and he said we've now translated all our literature into 59 languages and we're in 198 countries that's pretty powerful stuff for those two books that I just mentioned. Those two books contain a way of life that when alcoholics get a hold of it, they get sober and happy, no matter where they live, no matter what they're drinking. That's pretty good evidence that this works. And the funny thing is that uh, if you went back to the beginning of recorded history, 
maybe 4,000 years ago, there's always mention of the alcoholics. We were around forever. As Soon as they fermented some wine, we found out how to drink it differently than everyone else and soon became the outcast of the society, whatever society it was. And for all those years, the treatment of alcoholics was to ostracize them, to push them into a separate place, whether it's an institution, a jail, or just out of town. And nothing was able to lay a glove on the disease of alcoholism. Not medicine, psychiatry, everything that's been tried over all these years with two exceptions. One of them came a hundred years before AA and then AA itself. And uh, in, it, way back in the 1840s, and this is all true history, some of you knew you never heard of this, five guys were drinking in a bar on an eastern seaport city and they were successful business and then middle age and, and they knew they had a, had a drinking problem. They knew it they discussed amongst themselves they were going to lose their families, their business, and the respect of the community. And they just pretty much accepted it. They just said, well, let's enjoy it while we get it because they could see the handwriting on the wall. One of them said, I wonder if we could keep each other sober. And they all laughed at that and had another drink. And he said, no, I'm serious. I, we know we can't stay sober ourselves, but maybe we could keep each other sober. I'm going to go home, and we'll meet here next week, and I'm going to write a pledge, a solemn pledge. And then we'll come back, and we'll all take the pledge together in front of each other. Yeah, I'll drink to the pledge. <laughs> And they came back, and he had written out a pledge, and if you get the history, you can see exactly the words, I pledged solemnly to all the powers in the universe never to partake of any substance that changes my feeling, and on and on. And uh, they read it and solemnly took it with one another and went home and didn't drink. And they checked with each other each day, and pretty soon they had a week. And so they started telling other people in the city, why don't you come and stand in front of us and take the pledge? So they did. And they were fairly well-known businessmen, so they capitalized on the fact that they were well-known to attract others. And eventually they got the mayor. So, so if you're sitting around and you go, wow, the mayor just took that pledge. I ought to join that organization, get to hang around with the mayor. And so they kept doing this. And at the end of the first year, they had 4,000 people in a parade. 4,000 people. And they said, this is such an amazing thing. We ought to spread it around the rest of the United States. So they assigned vice presidents to go to other cities, such as Philadelphia and New York, Washington, DC. And they took the pledge and the message up to these other cities. And at the end of four years, they had around 300,000 people who had taken the pledge and were part of this thing that started in Baltimore, Maryland. Now, 400,000 people, at the end of four years, AA claimed 100, but we know they only had about 70. So, you know, we exaggerated even back then. Um, now, once this thing got successful, they, they were sitting around, the original five guys, and they said, uh, well, we have to name this. 
He said, well, why don't we name it after the number one man in America, George Washington? Because that'll get even more attention. So they named it the Washingtonian Society. And it never had anything more than the pledge. You just, it was kind of like a pyramid thing where the excitement was bringing more people to the parade and um, going out and get, well, how about don't you take the pledge? And then there was sort of an excitement level about it. Now, once something succeeds like that with high publicity, it was in the papers, Abraham Lincoln gave a speech at one of their annual uh, conventions before he was president, but he was one of the people who spoke to them about the wonderful work that they were doing. And about that time, the country was very interested in prohibition. And the prohibition forces thought that the Washingtonian Society would be a great group to endorse prohibition. And the um, movement to end slavery was picking up momentum. And they thought that this movement with all these sober people would be a wonderful shot in the arm for the abolition movement. So these are, that's a wonderful cause to get involved in. And they got involved in both of those causes, which we now know as outside issues, when you look at our traditions. And within a year, no one was left sober or in the organization. It disappeared off the face of this country to such an extent that in the late 1940s when Bill Wilson was writing the traditions about how the organization should handle the problems it was encountering as it got bigger, one of Bill's friends said, you ought to look at the Washingtonian Society and get some ideas from them. And he had never heard of them. How about that? He had never heard of them. So when you disappear, you disappear. So for that little period, there was a little glimmer of hope for alcoholics, and then that disappeared. My point in making these uh, stories about the history is to begin to establish how powerful the disease of alcoholism is that throughout recorded history, nothing was able to do anything really about it until 1935 when Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob Smith in a chance meeting began this thing that we know as Alcoholics Anonymous. Now another historical precedent about the powerlessness that we have, because that's really what our first step is all about, is in the early history of AA itself. And um, some of you may not have heard the origins of how Bill got sober. So I'll tell you in the matter of a few minutes. In the late 1920s, there was a millionaire uh, who belonged to a very wealthy family in Rhode Island named Roland Hazard. And still up in Rhode Island, that name, a lot of people know that name. And he was to take over the family business. But he was an alcoholic, and it became obvious that he was not going to last. And he himself realized and he'd been hospitalized and hospitalized. And out of desperation, since they had an unlimited amount of money, they decided to send him to Switzerland to see a psychiatrist named Dr. Carl Jung. And he stayed with that psychiatrist for a year and saw him every week. And Dr. Jung attempted in those therapy sessions to cause him to have a profound personality change so that he would look at the world differently and he wouldn't have to drink. And at the end, oh, thank you, my friend. At the end of the year, he said to him, you understand your situation. You understand that if you do go back to drinking, it's very likely you'll end up in a sanitarium somewhere. 
and so I want you to good luck and just stay away from the alcohol and he thanked Dr. Young and came back to the United States on his way back he went through Paris somebody in Paris asked him the wrong question they said would you like a drink Roland and he said don't mind if I do and in the matter of a few months he was back to see Dr. Young in worse shape than he was when he got there and he came back and he said Dr. Young you gotta help me I mean now I'm worse off than I was please please help me and Dr. Young said something that started Alcoholics Anonymous this is what he said and Bill Wilson later wrote a letter to Dr. Young to thank him for helping to start Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Young looked at Roland and said, there's nothing I can do for you. Now that'll pull the rug out from under you. I'm sorry, son. There's nothing I can do for you. That was a great act of humility when you're this, one of the smartest psychiatrists on the planet and you're willing to admit there's nothing I can do for you and he went nothing he said no I can't I tried I did everything that I know how to do and it didn't work so what he induced with that statement in Roland was an absolute state of desperation the, the, the state that we all encountered absolute hopelessness and then he said now I have heard of a few cases where people found a spiritual way to have a profound change if I was you I would go try to find that he didn't even tell him where to look now I submit to you that had he done that in the reverse order Roland never would have gone if he had simply come back and said why don't you try a spiritual thing what he had to do first was tell him there's nothing I can do for you whenever I see that sentence I think of the chapter 5 when we that we read at the AA meetings with the ABC's at the end three pertinent ideas and the first one we've been talking about that we're powerless over alcohol the second one is no human power could have relieved our alcoholism and I picture Dr. Young looking at Roland I mean this is the end of the human power and he looks at him and says there's nothing I can do for you and that's what we all come to grips with in one way or another in our own lives is the realization there isn't anything on the planet that can help me other than spirituality whoa and that's where it started at that time there was a spiritual movement that had started with a Lutheran minister Kent we had a Lutheran minister there who who got tired of the bureaucracy and the hierarchy of the church he said the problem with the religion is the middleman these churches and all the people in the middle we ought to just meet in small groups and talk about spirituality among ourselves and that's how we'll get spiritual and we'll leave out the churches and it caught on and his name was Frank Buckman and it became and the reason it was called the Oxford movement was that it had, he had spread it across the United States, England, and he was in uh, South Africa, and, and he had a bunch of people with him from Oxford University, and the South Africans called him the Oxford Group. Oh, the Oxford guys are here, and the name caught on, and this movement was called the Oxford Movement. And it was very big at that time in the United States and so Roland came back and found an Oxford group and got sober and stayed sober for a number of years and it's unclear whether he died sober because he did not become a member of AA after AA got started 
But he was the messenger that for all of us in this room that started the whole thing. Now he had a summer home in Manchester, Vermont, which becomes a very crucial city in the history of AA. Because also in that city, Bill Wilson was born about five miles from Manchester. He went to Burn Burton Academy in Manchester. So he, one of the key players in AA, is there in Vermont. Roland Hazard's family had a summer home in Manchester, Vermont. Dr. Burnham from Brooklyn had a summer home in Manchester, Vermont. And Dr. Burnham's daughter was Lois Burnham, the founder of Al-Anon, and the wife of Bill Wilson. And that's where they met, was there in Vermont. And then over from Albany, New York, where his father was the mayor, was Ebby Thatcher. And Thatcher is a big name up in Albany. I think there's a Thatcher Park and a Thatcher Square. And they had a summer home there. And Ebby was a raging alcoholic and a big friend of Bill Wilson's. And they did a lot of drinking together and partying. And Ebby was on his way to his bottom which consisted of uh, driving a car into a farmhouse on a Saturday morning, drunk, and uh, going all the way through the living room into the kitchen, at which point he asked the farmer's wife for a cup of coffee. <laughs> so we were spectacular alcoholics back in the 30s. He went in front of the judge and the judge let him go and said, look, you gotta behave yourself, we all know you, you got a good family, so please, try harder. And he tried harder, he looked and his family had made a deal with him. And they said to him, Ebby, you know the summer home in Manchester, if you agree to stay there and never come to Albany, where you <laughs> are embarrassing us because his father was thinking of running for vice president and he didn't need Ebby creating sensational stories to ruin his campaign. He said, if you agree to stay in Manchester, we'll give you the home and an allowance to stay away from home. We'll give you the summer home. He said, okay. So he had his drinking money, he had a home. Couldn't have a better deal than that. One day he's quite drunk and he looked at the house and it needed painting. He said, I'm gonna paint my house. How many alcoholics have done that? I'm gonna paint this house. <laughs> so we go downtown and we buy a couple bottles of booze, <laughs> a ladder, some paint and a paintbrush and come home and have a few drinks. And then we actually get the paintbrush out, paint maybe 15, 20 square feet. Then we go over and sit down, have a drink, kind of look at the nice job we've done and imagine the whole house painted. You ever do that? Man, this is really gonna look good. And he was watching the paint dry when some birds came by and crapped all over the paint, the fresh paint that he just had and it got him in furious and he went inside and got a couple shotguns, sat out there with his alcohol and any bird that came anywhere near his yard, BAM! He's firing the shotguns. The neighbors are getting quite upset they call the sheriff and he's arrested for firing guns and scaring people and all that. And he's in front of the judge and the judge is um, thinking of sending him to jail when Roland Hazard comes in. And Roland asks the judge if he would please release him in his care. He said, I'll be responsible for him. Well, with that family name and all of that, the judge felt comfortable sending him off with Ebby and he took him to the Oxford movement and Ebby got sober and they both went down to New York City to uh, work down there helping um, in the Oxford group with the soup kitchens and feeding the poor and doing all those things and while he was there Ebby got to thinking about his drinking buddy Bill Wilson who I, he knew was in New York and in Brooklyn so out of the blue, he calls him up to see how he's doing. 
And Bill Wilson, our co-founder, was on his last legs. He had been very successful on Wall Street and was, um, had lost everything. Nobody would hire him. His wife was working in a department store and he was stealing money from her purse in order to buy gin so that he could put together a great big deal so they'll be rich again. It was an illusion and he'd been through a local hospital a couple of times where um, our dear AA friend, Dr. Silkworth, had been working with him. And Ebby called him up and wanted to know how he's doing. And Bill said, come on over, come on over. It was Saturday, Lois had gone to work. He had a bottle of gin. He could hardly wait. The two of them would sit there and reminisce. And Ebby showed up and Bill looked at him and he looked healthy and it scared Bill. He said, Ebby, what's wrong? You look healthy. And he said, Bill, I found religion. And Bill said, don't worry, we can get rid of that. Come on in, come on in. I got a bottle of gin, we can get drinking again. Ebby said, no, Bill, I found this thing. I found this thing, this Oxford thing. I've never been so happy. And Bill's looking at him, he really is happy. And he can't figure it out. Bill went to church, he, he, he tried to believe in church, but he just couldn't believe in the divinity of anything. And so he sat there looking at Ebby and he couldn't uh, deny that Ebby looked wonderful. And he started talking to Ebby about um, his problems, believing in God and church and all the things he had when he was a little kid. And Ebby looked at him and said, well, Bill, why don't you choose your own conception of God? And there was no way that Bill could argue with that. How are you gonna argue with that? And so he thought about it and thought about it, but he drank the bottle and drank another one and ended up back in the hospital. Never felt so depressed. He was down just on his last legs. And out of sort of desperation, he thought about what Ebby said. And Bill said, I might as well give it a try. And he said, God, if there is a God, please show himself to me. And the room lit up. There was a bright light. He recalled a wind, sort of like being on a mountaintop. It lasted a couple of minutes of just wind noise and bright light. But as it was happening, he could feel the desire to drink leaving him. And he sat there just astounded at the end of that experience. And now we have another psychiatrist who saved us. And that's Dr. Silkworth. Because a little while later, Dr. Silkworth came in to see how he was doing. And Bill said, Doctor, you're not going to believe what just happened. And he said, what? He said, right in this room, there was this bright light God came in this very room and the wind was blowing and I saw all these wonderful things and I don't feel like drinking now I can imagine a few psychiatrists who would say oh very interesting why don't you take some of these pills and calm down and but Dr. Silkworth said if I was you, I would believe that and I would go with it. That was just wonderful. If I was you, I would believe that and go with it. And so he did and he went over to find Ebby at this Oxford group and Bill went drunk a couple times to the Oxford group meetings but eventually he got sober and never took another drink and never had a desire to drink even though he had the worst time in those early years, always being broke, just one failure after another. But that was the beginning of you and I sitting in this room. Now he went on to talk to Dr. Bob out in Akron. I'm not going to go through all that part of it. But out of all of that turmoil came the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and they borrowed uh, the principles of the Oxford movement uh, and turned them into the 12 steps 
that we are living by today. And eventually the alcoholics separated from the Oxford movement and we came up with the title for our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the title Bill wanted. Now the majority, it, as I understand it, wanted the way out. And uh, Bill didn't like that. So he went to the Library of Congress and there were 10 other books called The Way Out. And he knew the drunks wouldn't want to be number 11 in anything. <laughs> And there was no book called Alcoholics Anonymous, so playing to their egos, it was real easy to get the book named Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, the reason it was chosen for that anonymity, and I'm wandering all over on uh, historical stuff because I like it, um, the reason we ended up with the title Alcoholics Anonymous, in the beginning, there were so few alcoholics in, you know, in the city and in the little cities where it got started, that they were afraid that if it was publicly known that the number of drunks wanting to get sober would be so overpowering, people knocking on the door. <laughs> Such was the power of the egos then. If they find out we have this organization, there'll be thousands of them waiting in line to get into AA, and it'll drive us crazy. We won't be able to handle them all, so we have to stay anonymous. In other words, the reason for anonymity was quite different than it is now. They adopted that, and then as time went on, they found the great spiritual value of anonymity and maintaining it at the level of press, radio, and films, not breaking the anonymity of new people, not promoting Alcoholics Anonymous at all, but relying on other people to promote it for us, like reporters, doctors, and it's worked all these years. It's a program of attraction, not promotion. So anyway, uh, Bill took the six principles of the Oxford group and uh, was in the process of working on the book and people were pressuring him to get more done. They had farmed out the stories for the members to write to go in the back of the book and the members that didn't know how to write very well, they had some reporters helping them with their story so God knows whether they got edited or whatever but we did end up with some wonderful stories. And, there was a, and Bill was writing and writing and he was postponing the chapter how it works. He was dreading finally getting down to the nuts and bolts of how it works because there were so many different ways as you went around the country that people talked about how it worked. In New York City, it was a kind of an agnostic atheist crowd who thought it ought to be a psychological program. And they had their voices going. I don't know, enough of this God stuff. We go, right, this, this thing, you get in here and you just, you know. And then out in Akron, they said, look, it has to be Jesus or we're not going. So we had the Jesus crowd and the agnostic crowd coming to grips with each other. And out of that helter-skelter came God as we understand him. Bill doesn't give the credit to Ebby on that one day. He, he says it was out of this clashing of ideas and compromises. That's where the God as we understand him came from. Then, going from the six principles to the 12 steps, Bill sat in his bed trying to come up with the final version that he was going to submit to the fellowship and he knew he was going to hear all kinds of uh, arguing back and forth. And he sat there going, the drunks are wiggling through some of the loopholes of these six principles. So I'm going to write some loophole closers <laughs> to fill in between these things. <laughs> 
And he started inserting what he called loophole closers. And when he got finished closing the loopholes, he looked down and he had 12. And he felt 12 was such a wonderful number. I mean, that was, he said, oh, 12, 12 is so cool. It's very biblical, we got 12 months. I like 12 and it just became like, wow, 12. <laughs> so the reason we got 12 is loophole closing. And we ended up with these 12 steps and later on the 12 traditions. And as these 12 steps are incorporated into the alcoholic's life, miracles take place on a routine basis. Absolutely routine. They happen so routinely we don't even label them miracles anymore. Oh yeah, he, he, his family is all back together. He's a productive member of society. He's going to work and supporting things and he's helping out everywhere. And he used to be a selfish, self-centered bum who wouldn't do anything for anybody. And we forget that that is a miracle to transform that individual from this to that. And that's what happened with our 12 steps. And in the forward to the 12 and 12, Bill describes what he thinks the 12 steps are. And it's the two sentence thing that says, AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in nature, which if practiced as a way of life, will accomplish two things. One, it'll expel the obsession to drink, and two, it will enable the suffering alcoholic to become happily and usefully whole. So there's the, the author's assessment of what these steps are. They will get rid of the obsession to drink and enable you to become happily and usefully whole, complete, a complete person. And so, the reason I've told all this history, and um, if I wanted to, I could go to our literature, and I could show you where the second step appears in the big book, and, you'll, and you would notice, my God, it's way up around page 50, or 45, somewhere in there. So all of the steps and the preface with the Roman numerals, it's like 60 pages before we get to the second step. Why? Because the first step is that important. That's why. The first step says we're powerless over alcohol and our lives have become unmanageable. That's exactly what I've been talking about for 40 minutes, is the powerlessness that this disease inflicts on society and how for 4,000 years no one could lay a glove on the disease of alcoholism and if it hadn't been for a miraculous little series of events alcoholics would still be committed into uh, nut wards or just out on the street and they'd be outcast from society and we would not have two to three million miracles around the world. All of that came because of the power of these 12 steps. But the problem is, the 12 steps, the other 11 steps, will never be attempted unless you have to. You follow what I'm saying? You just aren't gonna talk anybody into making a man's a moral inventory, <laughs> prayer, meditation, admitting when you're wrong, la di da Not going to talk them into that unless they have to. So AA in no way tries to convince you of the existence of God. Even though we talk about God all the time, there's no AA God. If there's 150 people here, there's 150 different higher powers. It's not a religion. So no one here is trying to convince you that there is a God. But I'll tell you what we're good at. We're good at convincing you 
that you need to find a God or you're screwed. That's what we're good at. Hey, I understand you're not into interested in spirituality. No, I'm not. How about if I hold this 45? Well, I'll try it now. <laughs> it's like Tony Soprano saying, why don't you get spiritual? Oh, okay, hey, where's the prayer? <laughs> that's the first step. I'm simplifying it, but that's what it is. It is saying you are powerless and your life's unmanageable and there's no human power that can help you. So that's why we take a long time. And you'll see in our literature it suggests to you that people who have been sober for a number of years who aren't happy and just aren't getting it never took the first step 100%. They almost were as bad as the rest of us. You, they got a problem, but not the same problem that the rest of us have. It's a modified version of our problem. <laughs> Slightly less serious. Slightly different. Just, just a little bit different. Little different childhood. Little different part of the country. Little different background. Whatever. And so we're often a little different part of AA. So when you start out with being almost powerless over alcohol and almost having an unmanageable life, then you almost need a sponsor. <laughs> and you almost really need to do these steps. And you almost get sober. Now almost getting sober is very much like almost having a parachute. <laughs> After the plane gets blown up and you're out in the air, and you, you know, I almost took a parachute before we came up here tonight. <laughs> Too late. You follow what I'm saying? So what do we mean when we say powerless? This is what most newcomers think. They think that that means whenever they drink, they get all messed up. They think that alcohol being in their system causes all the problems. The problem with that limited definition of alcoholism is the following. You go to treatment, you learn all about alcoholism, and you say to yourself, you know something? They're right. Holy cow, I am an alcoholic. If I drink, it, I'm gonna die. I mean, I believe that to my soul. I honestly understand, as I never understood before, that I'm an alcoholic, and that I should never ever drink. Now that knowledge and that insight is useless. Now how do you like that? It will not keep us sober. Why? Because the disease of alcoholism is fatal because it gets us when we're sober. We are absolutely powerless over alcohol when we have no alcohol in our system. We have no defense against the first drink. That defense has to come from a higher power. So an alcoholic who's learned all this, oh my God, I'm so excited, I'm not drinking anymore, I understand if I ever drink, this is the insanity of alcoholism. And so he goes back to his old bar where his, some of his friends hang out and he likes to eat there. They have the best sandwiches in the world and he's sharing with the bartender. Joe, you know I'm an alcoholic. Well, I thought maybe you might be. Well, I am. I found out. I'm, I'm, I went to treatment. 
I understand alcoholism. It's an allergy, an obsession of just, oh my God, it's, I'm so glad to find this out. If I ever have another drink, my wife is leaving me. I mean, it's that, it's that simple. I mean, that's where it is. And the doctor said, if I ever do any more damage to my lip, could I have a beer? If I ever do any more, what was that? He just ordered a beer while he's explaining the fatal nature of his own situation. Does that sound crazy? Uh-huh. That's us. Fully understanding that alcohol will kill us, we go order another drink. And we tell ourselves, this time it'll be different. This time it will be different. So we're stuck with the situation where we're damned if we do and damned if we don't. It's a very hopeless situation. There's no way that you as an alcoholic aren't going to drink again unless a miracle takes place. And so that puts us in a very tough situation. We have to come to grips that there's no way we can stay sober without alcohol. But the alcoholic is facing what I saw as two horrible choices. One, I keep drinking and these horrible things keep getting worse. That's choice number one. I keep drinking and all these horrible things happen. Okay, I don't want that choice. So what's my second choice? Don't drink at all. Now there's a good, okay, I'm going to choose choice number two. I'm not going to drink at all. You know what happens when you don't drink at all? You are sober all the time. <laughs> all day. All night all week, all month, all year. No break. There's no break ever from being sober. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but that's why I drank. I needed a break from being sober. That's what alcoholism is. We can't stand being sober. Our lives are so painful and unmanageable that we need relief from them. Do you understand what I'm saying? I remember it. Oh boy, three more hours, three more hours, three more hours. <laughs> ah, okay, bartender, okay, 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 okay. You remember that? Oh, okay, now I'm all right. No more of that. That's why when people said to me, just don't drink, I went, you're crazy. Why would I do that? So do you see what has to happen in order for an alcoholic to survive? Something has to happen so they can not drink and be happy. That is the transforming miracle of our 12 steps. That is what happens. No alcoholic can just stay sober on willpower and be in pain for the next 30 years. You just can't do it. It's too hard. So we spent all this time setting up the first step so that when you take it, you take it with absolute despair. Okay, holy cow. And you're now we are willing to do the rest of the steps. Finally, we have this willingness and open-mindedness to do things that we think are stupid. I read those steps. I said, are you kidding? This is going to help me. I need money, man. I got six kids. I'm out of the Marine Corps. I need money. And this is all abstract, inventory, spiritual. I get out of here. So what was going to motivate me to do those steps? The first step. So if you are new, that is the key to long-term sobriety is 100% surrender. 
so that you are eagerly looking forward to solving this horrible situation that you're in. The point of the first step, to tell you quite frankly, is to convince you that your situation's a lot worse than you think it is. Now that's not good news, but it is good news. Because if you will suddenly realize, oh my God, it is so bad, I might pray. That's pretty bad. It has to be bad to do that, right? I mean, you're not going to. I might actually pray. And so that's why we spend all this time setting up the powerlessness and the unmanageability so that you won't walk away from the first step thinking that the rest of it is kind of optional. You know what I mean? Well, I'll work a few of the steps so when I go to meetings, I'll, it'll sound like I know what I'm talking about. I remember doing that. I had a little underline in the thing and I go, what was that? Rarely have we seen a person. I, I used to say that. Rarely have we seen a person, you know. I know drunks, they call them rarely. So anyway, we've reached the end of the time and I hope you've gotten an idea of the magnitude of this program and what it took for the universe to give us a solution. Most of us realize that Bill Wilson did not know how to write a book like this, that there was inspiration coming there in the 1934 and 35 that began this process and that that inspiration is being passed on around the world today as that very simple message is handed to one alcoholic after another. The secret of AA is one drunk talking to another. There's nothing else, everything else in AA is to facilitate one drunk talking to another. We have conventions, we have meetings, we got literature, we got all of that. But the real action is the sponsor talking to the, Bill used to call it, you know, somebody says, well, my God, you drunk, nobody knows what's going on. It's the blind leading the blind. And Bill said, no, it's the semi-blind leading the blind. <laughs> because there it was, we had people with three months sobriety going to Chicago to start AA there. You follow what I'm saying? They just, okay, take a book and go find a drunk. Okay. <clears throat> and Chicago has great AA now, but that's what was happening. It was just one person showing another one what they had already done. So all the people here who have a, a good bit of time, men and women who sponsor people, they are the custodians of this message. And if you're new, Please learn the message as it is in the book so that when you pass it on to the next person and you're going to be called on in your first year to pass this on to somebody newer than you. So please take the time to understand each of our steps the way they're written down so that the message you pass on to the next drunk will work and their life will be transformed. We're at the end of the time. I want to thank everybody for your attention and we'll stand and let's just stand in place uh, and reach across the aisles and we'll close it with the Lord's Prayer. Thank you all very much. <laughs>